Base is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It's a Wednesday. It's a wall pass Wednesday. We're taking your questions throughout the show. Tweet at us at Soccer Down here. Email us Soccer Down here at Gmail. Join us on the Twitch pitch, twitch.tv slash Soccer Down here. we got a million and one different things to get into. We've got Zinedine Zidane in trouble in Madrid. We've got a managerial vacancy with the Colombian national team, finally. We've got Copa Libertadores, second halves that go over 60 minutes. That happened. Um, We've got a very interesting offside interpretation from uh, the Champions League that made me want to throw everything I owned. I was very angry about this. Um, And not because it was a bad call either. We'll we'll explain in a little bit. Um, Also, Seattle advancing in the MLS Cup playoffs. Also, U.S. women's national team progress. Also, rumors and things going on with MLS rosters, players, options being declined. Lots of stuff to get into this morning, so we will be jumping around quite a bit. Mike Conti's joining us at 10 o'clock as well. All right, let's start. I mean, we could go any different direction here. Let's start with Seattle last night winning um, because I honestly don't think there's a ton to get into. It wasn't a surprise. They were the favorite. They played like the favorite. They were not dominant. They didn't dominate this match. They didn't put it away early. I I wouldn't call them convincing. But they did enough, and Dallas made it difficult for them, kept them to zero shots on target in the first half. That hadn't happened in a long time. First shot on target, a goal off a corner from Shane O'Neill, and that's it. I mean, Seattle had one more shot on target. Dallas never got a shot on target. They hit the post with Michael Barrios, who, in my opinion, should have started. I think Dallas wanted to stretch this game out. They were afraid of what happened last year in a shootout that they lost. Now they've lost to Seattle in a tight game. They just haven't shown enough to get past the big bully in the Western Conference, the Seattle Sounders. I think this time they got too conservative. Last time they were too open. There's an (laughs) in-between. There is an in-between there somewhere, and they got to find it because they weren't bad. You know, they didn't get played off the park. Seattle didn't dominate, but Seattle did enough. And and when you have the opponent who is the lesser team, who is not threatening you, you can kind of focus on breaking them down and creating your opportunities. And when you get one, then it's hard when you come into a game, if you're Dallas, and it's like, we're going to defend, we're going to be smart, we're going to sit the numbers behind the ball, we're not going to get ourselves stretched out. Oh, now we got to go do those things. Uh, okay, flip the switch. It doesn't always happen immediately. So they can't get it done. Uh, Ricardo Pepe coming on in the 80th minute, that he should have been there sooner. I I have some questions about the approach. The only sub before the final 10 minutes was Michael Barrios in the 58th. They didn't make more subs until the 80th, uh, the 81st, and then the 87th. I think Luchi Gonzalez needed to go for it a little bit faster because it was not coming for them. Needed to take more chances. Yeah, for me, once uh, Shane O'Neill scored off of the the corner in the 49th, I, I would have anticipated that Luchi Gonzalez would have started uh, substitutions to try to, to get that equalizer. But waiting as long as you did to bring in Barrios, waiting even later to bring in Pepe, uh, you know, there was the other chance that stuck in my head. It was a cross that came in. I want to say Barrios created it in the 83rd that went through the goal mouth, but it was... Uh, uh, too much was on it, so you couldn't get uh, the other end of the pass to create. So when Barrios is attached to the two chances that stick in your head that are 20 minutes apart, and you can't really think about anything else that Dallas did offensively, uh, you know, to me that just means that things should have been done sooner, especially after you got the one goal down. And, yeah, and so once again, we talk about Seattle, and they weren't dominant 
in, in that sense that you think of as like, yes, the field tilted for the entire 90 minutes. No, that wasn't the case, but they took advantage of the, the opportunity that they had, the one chance in the 49th. I did not have Shane O'Neill on my bingo card for uh, the individual to get to the goal on the board, but once again, that's what this season's all about. It's about getting it done however you get it done, take advantage of the opportunity. Seattle did that early in the second half. They're out the door, and they go to the next round. Seattle's got to be better uh, to continue to advance, unless teams are going to play them in this manner. Um, Seattle created nine chances. That's not bad. Uh, Dallas created eight, and I'd have to go back and look to see when they came. I'm assuming most of Dallas's eight came when the game flipped, when Seattle had the lead and Dallas had to take chances. Uh, Ryan Hollingshead had the best chance created for Dallas. It was his cross that Michael Barrios put off the post, and then Ricarte's rebound was cleared off the line. Um, Jason Nix is applauding you for figuring out something with your microphone. Um, you oh. actually sound normal now. Well, it's uh, amazing what happens when you plug it into the right port and you actually uh, adjust the volume to where it's a little more than 50%. So, uh, yeah, so... A bully for me that I've actually started figuring things out. Uh, you know, uh, give, give Nick's give it time. Something will happen where I will uh, drive the entire apple cart crazy once more. So just count this one and, uh, and uh, cross your fingers. Yeah, accurate. Uh, Ricky says we're changing the name of the show to Soccer FC. We'll get into that one too in a minute if you don't know <laughs> yeah, what, what Ricky yeah. is referring to. Yes. Um, uh, uh huh. Abby loved the game last night, said it was constant action. I, I mean, just as a neutral, I liked the Columbus-Nashville game a little bit more. I felt like it was more in doubt. Um, this one, I never believed Dallas was going to win the game. I did think they might tie it. I didn't ever have belief they would win. Columbus-Nashville, I didn't know who was going to win, the way that game played out. This one, it just it, it had an inevitability to it, to a degree. Um but again, it's the playoffs. It's it's like, okay, Seattle should win, but the first half as it goes, it's kind of like, well, are they going to? Yeah. Are they going to get a shot on target? And it just never came, and it never came, it never came. Then at halftime, you're like, well, does Dallas go for it here? And they didn't. They give up that goal early in the second half, and that's where it started to feel inevitable. It's just, okay, Dallas has got to show something here. They never did, and I'm, I'm a little surprised with a young team, once you fall behind, I, I think you have to roll the dice quickly. I think at times managers will, will wait in that situation too long to try to find the spark. You, know, you do run the risk, and we've talked about it, where when you completely sell out to try to score a goal and you make three, four subs, and you've completely changed your shape to where there's really no defensive responsibility, and then you get that equalizer, then you got to try to make sense of it. And that's what's very difficult. Atlanta struggled with that against D.C. at the Benz, obviously. It's tough, but it's the playoffs. You can't wait until the 80th minute to say, okay, now we're going to go for it. No, you got you got to go sooner. And you had the players to do it. I mean, Pepe is in a great run of form. He should have been on the field sooner. Franco Haro was a little bit of a disappointment in the postseason. Um, Michael Barrios should be starting, in my opinion. I think Gonzalez went too conservative with that left side with Nelson at left back and Hollingshead at left wing. Just play Hollingshead at left back. He can still get forward and help you, but he can defend. You, you don't need to double up on that side. It, it felt like it was too much to worry about conceding as opposed to changing your personality a bit. They've struggled to score goals. Give yourself more of an opportunity to score goals in this case. And it just it never came. It, it, even after the goal, if you want to come in to Seattle and be conservative, I can understand that. Right. After you fall behind at the beginning of the second half, minimum by the 60th minute, you you got to be changing it up. you got to give guys 30 minutes to play, and that's probably going to be about 10 to get comfortable and then a good 20 minutes to really go for it you got to sell out at that point. You can't make three subs after the 80th minute when you're trailing in a playoff game that ends your season. You, you've got to make the three subs at the 60th minute. You yeah. want to save a couple for the end? Cool. Make the three at the 60th minute to change that up. Bring on Pepe, bring on Ferreira, bring on Barrios, and go for it. 
just go for it at that point so you have a chance. Nathan Pugh's in for a couple of different topics this morning, but on this one, he says he watched the recording this morning. He's old and can't stay up that late. <laughs> Seattle knows what they want to do and are good at doing it. I'm not anointing them favorites until I see how Thursday night goes. Yeah, I, I think Minnesota and Kansas City can both hurt Seattle. I think if that game's in Kansas City, if they win, I like Kansas City as the favorite. Um, I think Seattle would be favored over Minnesota, but I think Minnesota will threaten with that front four that the Loons have. They'll threaten Seattle more, and I think Seattle is vulnerable defensively. It's another reason why I was a little surprised that that Lucha Gonzalez didn't go for it sooner. Um, they're good, and they've been there, and the moment's never too big for them. They handle all of the adversity in a match. They don't get stressed out when they don't have a shot on goal in the first half. They're like, we're, we've been here. We've done this. We got two trophies. We're going to get there again. We believe in the group. And I think Brian Schmetzer is a very good manager for that group because he transmits that. There's never freaking out from him. There's never that vibe of we're in trouble from him. He never feels like he's on edge. And that helps. You know, In these situations, that helps. And, and when you're a veteran group, I think that's the feel you want here because I mean Seattle is the favorite at this point um, I don't think they've been the best team this season but I think they're the favorite in general out of who's left because of the experience I do think it will be difficult for them to go to Kansas City and win in a knockout game that will be a big challenge for them but in general they're the favorite they might not be favored in the Western Conference final if it's Kansas City yeah, and when you have someone like a Brian Schmetzer who has the experience of being in these playoff situations, knows what deep runs are all about, and you don't see the you don't see the histrionics, you don't see uh, gesticulations wildly for situations, you see calm demeanor on the touchline. I think that that transmits itself to the players that are out there representing what you want to have done when it comes to game plan. You know, it's like you, you're adopting that personality out there. And if something happens where you end up down a goal, you don't see Brian Schmetzer losing the plot, jumping up and down, trying to treat it like it's uh, PE class in the second period, you know, early in the morning, it's very calm. He's writing notes. It's, you know, directions here and there. It's not where he's completely and totally been out of shape. And I think that that helps in those kinds of situations where you are trailing. It also helps calm you down when you have that lead and you're trying to close the deal out. You're not getting too wrapped up in what's going on around. You're not getting too over emotional. You're focusing on the task at hand and you need that this time of year. You need that with this team. Let, 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 I want to, I want to be clear on this. There are some teams that need the manager to be going nuts Right. There are some teams that feed off of that, usually younger teams, usually teams that you know feed off of emotion. Um, Seattle's not. Seattle's a veteran group. You know, they, don't, they don't need that. That would unsettle them, whereas some teams need that to get going. They need a little bit of an oomph from the manager. Every team's different. Every situation's different. Schmetzer's the right guy for that group, which makes you wonder why they haven't got a deal done unless... And remember, you're, you're, you're slapping your hands around. What does this mean? What? No, no, no. I'm agreeing with you. But I don't know what you're agreeing with because I haven't said anything yet. No, it's like unless. <laughs> and I was waiting for the Well, what, what do you think was... I'm going to say? Because you were like, yeah. No, no. It's like unless. What, what did you think I was going to say? He's not unless he's done after this run. And then Seattle has to look at the folks who are out there on the market. I was waiting nope, for your unless what I was to finish say. your nope, sentence. Nope. That's not what I was going to say. That's what I thought. Okay. It, that's, that's why I stopped you. Uh -huh. Unless the manager, the assistant manager that DC is interested in, who is in Seattle, if they think he's the guy going forward and they don't want to lose him. And they've okay. made the decision that they've gotten everything they can get from Schmetzer and they don't want to lose Gonzalo Pineda and they want to keep him in the group. And the only way they can keep him in the group is to make him the manager. And he's going to come a lot cheaper than Brian Schmetzer would as well. That's my my wonder here about Seattle. Is that the plan? Is it we have went as far as we can go? Maybe we, we have another good year next year, but we're going to have to start getting younger at some point. We're going to have to start rebuilding a little bit with this group. We don't want to lose this guy because we think he could be here for a long time. We believe in him, and 
we've got to make a tough decision now. Because how many times do you see that where a club, a team, holds on to somebody because they've done really well, that contract comes up, they pay them a lot of money to come back, yep. and then it's diminishing returns. Meanwhile, a top assistant who is ready goes elsewhere and does really well. That can be a little scary. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if that might be what's at play in Seattle. Let's wait and see what happens. But uh, Schmetzer does not have a new deal. Greg Vanny is out on the market. Uh, Carlos Quiros is out on the market now, too, which means the Colombian national team is in the hiring phase. Uh, this has just finally happened. It was down to negotiating details. Uh, Monterey is in the hiring phase, and Monterey is linked to anybody you can imagine right now. Um, According to ESPN, Monterey has reached out to Kike Setien, former Barcelona manager who is still waiting to get paid from Barcelona. Um, Reach out to him to see if he's interested. It sounds like, and this is from ESPN, that Matias Almeida is the favorite, is the best prospect they have at the moment. But They want to find out if Setien is interested. They're interested as well in Ignacio Ambris from León. They're interested as well in Guillermo Vázquez, who was formerly at Atletico San Luis. Another interesting one that they are, they have some, you know, vibes here and they want to see if he'd be interested is uh, Michel González, who is the uh, legendary Spanish forward, Real Madrid player, played in Mexico, uh, was a star in the 86 World Cup in Mexico, he last managed at Pumas, won Greek titles earlier in the decade with Olympiacos. A little bit of a vagabond, I guess, on the, on the managerial side. But he's had success in Mexico, and he's a, he's a big name. So those are all names that have come up with Monterey at this point. Setien is a, is a fascinating one at this stage. Um, I mean, would he be interested in coming to North America? Yeah. Um, if he would, there might be a few other teams that might want to jump in there and have a, a chat with Kike Setien. He has had success. The Barcelona time didn't go well, but Barcelona's not going well for a lot of people these days. So eh, you might want to put that one to the side. Um, another one on the managerial front that I think is important because his name hasn't really come up since he was let go by Flamengo is Dolme Tarant. Uh, one, Flamingo's won one game in the six they've played since they fired Dome Toronto. Uh, maybe they kind of screwed that one up. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you overreacted to two bad losses, Flamingo. I don't know. I'm just saying. You're out of the Libertadores. The defending champs are gone. They're out of the Copa de Brazil. There's talk that they've got some financial issues. Why would they have financial issues? Because you've lost that prize money. And what makes you think there could be financial issues? Uh, Dome Toronto had a contract. And he has not been paid the severance fee yet. And he's not happy about this. So now people are saying, well, can they pay the severance fee? They just got knocked out in the round of 16 of the Libertadores. Are they in trouble? Are they going to have to start selling players? So now you've got Dolme Tarant, who I don't know the terms of that contract, and everyone's different. You know, Could he take another job, or does he want to make sure he gets a severance fee that could be substantial? That factors into his availability. Also, from a player perspective... Flamingo might have to sell in January to balance some books and pay some severance fees and handle some things, and there might be some really top-notch players available from Flamingo. Craziness. It's going to get crazy. It's going to get crazier. This is the silly season in North America and South America and about to be worldwide in January, so get ready. What do we have on the Twitters about last night, Seattle, and anything else that has gone on so far on the show? Okay. Uh... Nathan has some other stuff involving Champions League. That's not has uh, on the show yet. No, I know. Uh, and so then we'll go with Hick Ruffman. That's, I was holding it. I was just telling you what's, uh-huh. what's in the queue for later. Okay. So Hick Ruffman, otherwise known as Rick A, is uh, on in the Twitters this morning. Do you, Jason, do you have any thoughts on Miguel Angel Ramirez? Not a lot of first-team coaching experience, but has done really well with Independiente Del Valle. Any chance Atlanta United could go after him? Oh, El Mazaflo is going to be excited about that one. Um, (laughs) I mean, yeah, he's done really, really well, and he's developed talent. Um, As I've said about Heinze, it'd be a different kind of hire. I don't think it's a bad hire, but those kinds of hires, managers with 
less experience, managers at clubs who have different expectations. Although Independiente del Valle, you know, has won a Copa Sudamericana. You know, you, you compare the resumes just with, with Heinz and, and, and Ramirez. Well, one's got a Copa Sudamericana and one's qualified for the Copa Sudamericana. Eh. Um, both come with risk because of the limited experience. You know, but any hire comes with risk. I mean, you do have to remember that. Like, it's not like Tata Martino was a slam dunk. People questioned it. Frank DeBoer was not a slam dunk. People questioned it, obviously. And any hire you make, people are going to question. I mean, at this point, I feel like you could hire anybody in the world. If they hired Pep Guardiola tomorrow, there'd be a hit piece tomorrow about it. Like, oh, this isn't going to work. He's never managed an MLS. He doesn't understand the salary cap. Um, okay, whatever. It, it's it's going to get criticized. It's going to get questioned no matter which direction you go. How much risk do they want to take on with this? Because this is not DC United to me. This isn't even the LA Galaxy to me. Atlanta United, with the roster they have and coming off of the year they did, I think the expectations are big next year. I think DC, it's okay, it's time to rebuild. It's time to really, truly build. It's going to be a project. It's going to take a couple of years. Galaxy, I think with their roster, with, with only 13 players under contract right now, you have to rebuild. You don't have a choice. <laughs> it's just a, you don't have enough of players right now. So you've got to rebuild. Atlanta, you don't. I mean, you've got 21 guys on the roster right now. You've got your core lineup pretty well settled. You can upgrade in some positions, sure. You've got talent. You've got Joseph Martinez coming back. Out of the teams, and even Toronto, I think Toronto's got questions. I mean, Toronto's got questions just in the sense of what their structure is going to be next year. They might not be based in Toronto for half of the year or more. I mean, that's a challenge because they did that this year. Do, do some of those players want to do that again? Yeah. That's going to be tough. Um, I think out of all the teams that have a managerial vacancy in Major League Soccer right now, Atlanta is best positioned to win MLS Cup next year. So that means the hire is a little different than the others where there could be build or rebuild statuses to it. And that could change who you're looking for. Um, who you're looking at. I, I'd be very intrigued by somebody, you know, like like somebody who's had success at a club who is known IDV is known for developing young talent. They're always going to go to that because they don't have much money. They make their money by selling talent. They have to produce good talent. They've been doing this for a while. They've created a bit of a template. Could you bring that here and would it work? I'd love to see it. I'd love to see the experiment. I don't know if Atlanta's the best situation for the experiment because I don't know if Atlanta's in an experimental phase. Right. I think Atlanta is in a trophies next year. Not trophy or bust, but compete for trophies on all fronts next year. I think that's the, the mode that Atlanta's in, more so than the Galaxy because they need to build a roster, more so than D.C. because I don't think they're that close. And I do think more so than Toronto because uh, the, the rumors are there's going to be more upheaval in Toronto. And, and I think it can be expected with what they might be facing next year. We don't know at this point what they're going to be looking at with, you know, can they start their season in Toronto? Do yeah. they have to go to a uh, six-week training camp somewhere else just to prepare for a season and hope maybe they can start in March in Toronto? If you can't, then what does that mean? You go on the road for a month, you... You base in Hartford again for a month. You wait it out, maybe two months, maybe add another month. We don't know. I mean, there, there's great things that are being said about the vaccines. There's great progress being made. There's a lot of positivity about that. That doesn't mean Toronto can plan on a home opener for Saturday in March. There's no way to do that. So Toronto's going to have some problems that have nothing to do with Toronto FC as a club. And that's a scary element, too. So I, I the only concern I have about Ramirez would be that idea of would he be ready to win day one in a club like this? Because IDV is a very different club. Who knows? Since we're talking about Copa Libertadores, uh, I admit that I watched River Plate and Atletico Paranaense yesterday. I missed out on Flamingo and Rossing. And 
the the madness that was going on in the Copa Libertadores last night. It was fun to see you discuss it, but I missed out on it. So what was the madness that happened? Discuss it. I was screaming in all caps I, all night. I, I, that's it. what I'm saying. It there was wasn't like a whole saying. lot of discussion. It, it was, ah! <laughs> that was basically what it was. Um, okay, the easy one was River going through. Uh, they won 1-0 at home. They won 2-1 on aggregate. Nicholas De La Cruz, uh, penalty off the post, off the back of the goalkeeper, back off the post, back out, and De La Cruz puts home the rebound. Um, River was in control for the most part. It got a little dicey the longer it went. They did have the away goal advantage, so they were they were in control from the start. Parnayense had some chances. River got it done. Not a ton there. Yeah. All right, the other early game was Santos and Liga de Quito. And it was tough for, for Liga de Quito because they had to go to Brazil and overturn a 2-1 deficit from the first leg in Ecuador. That's a lot. Um, they had never won in Brazil in the Libertadores. Well, they did last night, but they didn't win by enough to go through. They won 1-0. That meant it was 2-2 on aggregate, but Santos had two away goals to keep those one. So Santos goes through. The craziness here was very late. I guess it would have been at the beginning of stoppage time, um, which I think was originally set for six minutes. Well, the uh, final whistle was blown after 67 minutes of the second half. They do only play 45-minute halves in the Copa Libertadores, just in case you're confused. Um, They added six minutes on. They had a situation where uh, the Santos goalkeeper was coming out very aggressively. Uh, a Liga de Quito player was charging in. He didn't back out of the challenge. I, I thought Santos blew this up. He didn't back out of the challenge. The, the Santos goalkeeper made more contact with him than the Liga de Quito player made contact with the goalkeeper. But you know how it is. You always protect your goalkeeper. Well, you had that start with a couple players, you know, starting to, to shove each other. The referee, Nestor Pitana from Argentina, he comes in and grabs the first Santos player and like swings him around to get him out of there so he's not fighting with the Liga de Quito player. Another Liga player comes up from the other side. He starts wanting to fight with the Santos player <laughs> that the referee's <laughs> holding. Um, the bench is clear. You've got everybody out on the field. Um, it took a long time to break that up. You had multiple little flare-ups around it. Then the referee had to go look at VAR for red cards because there were plenty of situations in this. Um, ended up sending off one of the Santos players, two from Liga de Quito. I think a, an assistant coach from Liga de Quito was sent off as well. Uh, goalkeeper for Santos got slapped at the end of all of it. Yeah. That was one of the send-offs for Liga de Quito. A substitute like smacked him in the face. Uh, they added on the time. and the, You could tell Pitana, the referee, was just furious with all of it. Cause he had to go watch all these videos and say, okay, that guy's getting a red. Okay, that guy's getting a red. Okay, this guy's getting a yellow. Okay, this guy's getting a red. So he goes through all the videos. It's just going and going and going. They come back. All, both teams are in his face yelling. You can just tell he's over it. <laughs> he he shows all the red cards. He has to go around try to find the one substitute for Liga de Quito. He was trying to hide the one who slapped the goalkeeper. He He's looking for him. He's looking for him. He finally spots him. He shows him the red after showing everybody else their red cards. Comes back. It's a free kick for Santos after the initial flare-up. He gives the ball. They take the free kick. He blows the final whistle. It, it was amazing. He's like, no, we're done. <laughs> We're done. We're not doing this anymore. We're done. I'm going home. He was ticked. But he handled it dead on. I mean, the red cards he gave were proper red cards. Um, you have to do You can't just say, well, it's, it's stoppage time. You can't look at it. Because, yeah, these players deserved reds. And now Santos is going to miss one of them in the next round. Liga de Quito next year is going to miss these guys in Libertadores games. You have to get it right. He did. Everybody got out of hand. He sorted it out. It took 67 minutes of a second half to get to a winner, but it, they got there. <laughs> um, then you had the nightcap, and it didn't get any less contentious with Rossing and Flamingo. So Rossing gets a goal in the second half. They're up 1-0. They're up 2-1 on aggregate. It's on the road um, at the Maracanã. 
And late in the second half, uh, Gabriel Arias, the goalkeeper for Rossing, made two or three just massive saves late. Then it's a stoppage time equalizer from William Arau from Flamingo. That sent it to penalties. They go straight to penalties, no extra time. And then, after everybody's made their penalties, Aral steps up in the fourth round for Flamingo, and his penalty saved. So he has mm-hmm. the, the moment of joy to send it to penalties, then his penalty gets saved. It's a good save from Arias, not a great penalty. And Rossing converts. Uh, Sebastian Beccasese is face down on the pitch at, at the Maracanã, losing his mind. Um, it's the... the I mean, it's a massive win for Rossing. They haven't won the Libertadores since 1967. So now you've got the questions on the Brazilian side of what's next for Flamingo. They had got back to the the glory days. They won the Brasileiro. They won the Libertadores. Jorge Jesus goes to Benfica. They hire Dome Tarrant. They get antsy. They fire him, and now it's all crashing down. And now the worry for Flamingo fans is, okay, now we're in trouble. Who should we go hire? We need to hire a new manager. Gabriel Heinze, his name has come up already for yeah. <laughs> Flamingo, along with everybody else. Um, it, it's just Santiago Solari, former Real Madrid manager. His name has come up. It's madness in South America. But this game was a really good Libertadores kind of match. Um, it, it was tense. It, it had some friction. The One of the athletic trainers for Rossing was sent off, which was awesome. I hadn't seen that one in a while. Uh, you did have a red card for Flamingo, a second yellow. So you had send-offs. You had bench people getting sent off. You had screaming at the end. I mean, it was wild. Um, the Copa Libertadores is wonderful. I, I highly, highly recommend it. And Becca Sese was styling and profiling. He always is. any doubt. He always is. Um, he is a manager that will have big things in front of him. I don't know what they are. I don't know if it's Europe. I don't know when. Um, he's a Jorge Sampaoli protege, worked with him with the Chilean national team, with the Argentine national team, went to Defensa y Justicia and had a great season with a tiny club, getting them to second place in the table and has had a, a stutter with his move to Independiente, went to Rossing. Rossing's in crisis a little bit right now because your sporting director has left, uh, Diego Melito. He left the club. He hired Becca Sese. There were fears because in the six-game first stage of the Argentine uh, Copa Diego Armando Maradona that Rossing hadn't won their first four. Rossing was focused on Libertadores, but that combined with a not-so-great first leg put a lot of pressure on Becca Sese that he could be fired. He might quit on his own and leave with Milito. Nobody knew what's going to go on now. Um, but Rossing is now everything's flipped, and they're celebrating. He could still walk at some point after the Libertadores is done, uh, which would not surprise me at this point, because I think with a win like this and what he's done previously, his name could come up with some bigger jobs, and that could get very interesting. He's very young, but he's got some really good experience, and his work with Sampaoli is strong too. Sampaoli is a Bielsa guy who takes it in a different realm. He's a little more pragmatic. But Becca Sese is one to watch in the long term as well. And there is a certain way that you can watch the Copa Libertadores if you haven't had the chance to do it uh, recently, yes? Yes. <laughs> that was the cheesiest lead-in to a read I've ever heard. Uh, mm. FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. You can <laughs> sign up there. As John's just throwing his arms around all morning. Um, you can sign up there. Free trial for seven days. You want to sample it. You get be in sports, English and Spanish. You get uh, one thing that they have there that's very cool is La Liga TV. Uh, that's through BN, um, which is a, a just a great channel dedicated to La Liga. Uh, you get Teise. You get uh, RCN out of Colombia. So you get Colombian League matches. You get Tigo Sports out of Guatemala, so you can watch Guatemalan matches. You can add the Bra- Brasileiro pack to watch all of the Brazilian first and second division. You can add the Italian language pack. 
to watch uh, Rai Italia. You get a couple of, of team specific channels there as well. You got Real Madrid TV there. You got Sevilla TV. There's there's just tons of stuff. Tons of stuff. All the Argentine league games are there, no matter what network they're broadcast on. And they archive the stuff so you can watch it back later. It's very, very cool. Uh, Fanatis is some a place that I've subscribed to for, man, four plus years now. Got so, me hooked. FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. And it helps four, the show, so thank you. Yes, four matches in the Copa Libertadores today, including Independiente Del Valle as part of the, the early doubleheader. 5.15 and 7.30 tonight. Yeah, yeah, Independiente Del Valle is one that I will be watching. Uh, it's going to be tough for them. They've got a challenge today. Uh, they um, have to go to Uruguay, to Nacional. That won't be easy. Boca and Internacional of Brazil have the first leg of theirs. First leg was postponed last week after the death of Maradona. Uh, also be watching 7.30, Jorge Wilstermann hosting Libertad. See if they can overturn a, a bad result in Paraguay, but it's in Bolivia where Jorge Wilstermann has been very, very good. Uh, Palmeiras and Delphine as well. So you got two in the early round at 5.15. You got two at 7.30. Nacional's a favorite at home at yeah, 5.15. Palmeiras is a big favorite at yeah, home at 5.15. Palmeiras will go through. Uh, Internacional is a home underdog against Boca. That's about right. And Jorge Wilstermann is a prohibitive favorite at home against Libertad. Feels about right, but they got to overturn a deficit, so even a win might not be enough for Jorge Wilstermann. They've got to win by big. And we've right. got one tomorrow, too. Yes, yes, one tomorrow. We'll get there tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, okay, J. Dub Parker on the Twitch pitch says, I don't know if this has been discussed before, but what are the thoughts on MLS managers having to do interviews in the middle of the match? J. Dub is not a fan. Not a fan either. What are your thoughts on it besides that? I think it's, I know what the networks are trying to do. I know that you're trying to, since you don't have the sideline presence there under the, the normal sideline reporter where you're getting the coach coming off, you're getting the other coach coming back, whether it's headset or sideline reporter who gets to ask those questions, it gives you that, that opportunity to sit there and get the reaction from the coach on the pitch at a certain period of time. I would much rather it be in that standard format where you're coming off, you hand them a headset, you give the question or two, you get them off, and then you, you handle it that way. But the in-game stuff, I think it's distracting to the coach, first and foremost, because they're trying to focus on what's going on in front of them. And the answers that you're going to get from the questions that you're going to ask the coach is focused on what's going on in front of him. He's not going to give you. He's not going to sit there and open up his his files and sit there and say, "Well, you know, you know, what we've been thinking about is this, this, and this." You're not going to get anything insightful. You're not going to get really anything of any great depth because the guy's focused on what's going on in front of him. You're going to get maybe the standard fifteen second sound bite. It's not even going to be the standard twenty second sound bite. It's going to be short because. The guys know that it's something they have to do. They want to get it done. They want to get back to coaching. To me, it's just counterproductive on about nine different levels. Yeah, yeah, I am I am not a fan at all of it. Um, I understand it without a sideline reporter. I think they kind of need to or, or need to do something with it. I don't mind the one coming back from the half uh, or the one pregame. I, I don't like it in-game. I've yeah. never been a fan of that. I think it puts the coach in a tough spot. I just don't think it – I don't think you get good enough material to make it worth it. And I don't like putting a coach in that situation at all. No. And that's the and that's the thing. It's like, guys got work to do. I mean, think about any other job that that, that is going on. You know, is someone who's – locked into what's going on in front of them and it's just outside of sports i mean just apply it to anything else that's going on in the world you know it's like somebody's really locked into their work it's their work day they're in a groove and then you're sitting and you're tapping them on the shoulder it's like oh dude i need to talk to you real quick it's distracting for them and it's it's just counterproductive for me yeah i agree uh, i agree with colonel as well it says the artificial crowd noise was annoying oh. i think it was just mixed weird again yeah and and it feels like Fox really pushes the artificial noise hard. Um, and it's just when it's real crowd noise, 
I love it when it's super loud, and, and I love when the announcers are almost in the middle of the mix. I think Fox does a really good job with that, with real noise. Yeah. I don't like it with fake noise, because you, you see the empty stands. You know it's fake. Like when, it's, when you know it's fake, I feel like it's got to be in the background. You know, It's better than nothing, although you have enough field mics, and maybe they were a little worried about some of the salty language. Yes, the, the colorful um, metaphors. Yeah, maybe they were a little worried after what happened in, on Sunday night, but... Uh, it's just, it was too much, and, and I don't like the too much with the fake noise at all. It's I, I wish they could get a little bit better balance there. Modiflo shared some of the videos from the uh, Liga and Santos match in the Twitch pitch. Um, shows uh, Pitana, the referee, slinging people around. That's good times. Um, <laughs> let's see what else we got here, because there's a lot of stuff to catch up on. Uh, Modiflo says Santos was practicing the dark arts the whole game. Their plan worked. I agree. Um, Jason Nick says the mid-game interview for the coach is better than the mid-game interview for Brad Gazan at the All-Star game. But that's an All-Star game. You yeah, can that, do fun that stuff Yeah, that I can there. sit there and I'm like, it, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's, it's a different vibe entirely. I don't have a problem with that. No, that one, I'm good, I'm good with that. Because it's just trying to try, it's just yeah. trying th- different things. Yeah. It didn't. It, you can't really do it effectively, or you need to have more experience in knowing when to actually talk to the guy. Because I think right. at times it's like you're trying to have a conversation with him, and he's got to be a little busy. He's, yeah, so. <laughs> they're coming at they're coming at him, and he's and it's like, so Brad, what do you think about? Well, him? no, see? no, we're not going to throw him under the bus that bad. They didn't ever do that. It's it's when the play transitions. They're not asking Brad a question when somebody's dribbling in on him. Don't don't make it like they did. No, but it, there was it's, a, there it's was a when, transition opportunity where they they started something, you got transition, and then he really had to get to work, and you're in the middle of a question. People don't understand how much focus it requires to be a goalkeeper. The ball can be 50 yards away, but you've got to be locked in when your team loses possession in that mode. And that's what would happen. It's just, oh, like, the, the ball's on the other end of the field. Well, you know, we're talking, and, and Brad's like, yeah, I, I'm trying to organize my defense. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Katie asks, could you imagine Mourinho in an in-game interview? Oh. That'd be pretty good. That'd be awesome. He might go off. Yeah, see, that's one that you might have to, ha- that you might have to go on either seven-second delay, which is a physical impossibility when you're live, uh, unless you do it from the absolute beginning of the half or something, when you're coming out of commercial. Well, I don't think he's going to start dropping f bombs. I mean, why are you putting that on Mourinho? It's just I think that it, it, depending on the game state at the time that you ask. No, I think he'd be salty. I don't think he'd be like cursing people out. No, but I think that if he's, I think if he's trailing, I think that it might get a little colorful. No, I don't think it would. He's a professional. Have you ever seen him do that in a press conference? No. Or a pregame? No. The only time you heard Mourinho use that kind of language was in a behind-the-scenes documentary, which was behind the scenes. Yeah. Hey, give Jose some credit. That man knows how to work the microphones. I think it'd be a hoot. No, I don't think it would, because I think he'd be angry about it. I don't think he'd tell you anything. I think oh, he'd no, be no, like, no. I think he'd give you the Marshawn Lynch, like, I'm here so I don't get fined. I'm we here done? so I okay. don't get fined. Bye. Anyway, in, in, interview is over. I'm gonna get. Wednesdays with Reddit. If you don't watch the uh, soccer over there show on Monday nights, uh, when crazy oddball stuff pops up, that's the sound effect that happens. It's not from Reddit. It's from the Twitch pitch this time around. Oh. Uh, but same effect. Um, El Mataflow shares this one. I, I've seen this bubble up a little bit, but I don't have all the details on it. Uh, Jolian Lescott, remember him? Yeah. He accidentally signed a one-year contract for Spanish third-tier club uh, Racing Murcia after thinking he was only signing up to play an exhibition match. (laughs) Now, this club's in the Copa del Rey, and I can't remember who they got drawn with, um, but they were trying to do the thing that... I know there's been a couple clubs in England that have done it, where they they try to sign a bunch of like former pros and stuff for their cup run. And they go get a bunch of like you know 40-year-old guys and 45-year-old guys to play in their cup run. So they get a lot of exposure and... You know, it doesn't ever really lead to anything. 
that's what they were trying to do at one point. And they had a whole bunch of names attached that they were going to try to sign. I want to say Samuel Eto was one. Um, I think Lescott's the only one who took the bait. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I guess they actually did bait him because he signed a year's contract. So now they're, wow. I guess, expecting him to play games in the Spanish third division. He's like, nah. <laughs> so I, I don't know all the details there, but yeah, that's going to be a fun one to watch. Oh, that's great. Um, okay. Uh, J Dub asks, "Are you part Italian?" No. Uh, you really like to speak with your hands, the slash movement, I, the fist bumps, I do. et cetera. I, I do, and that's just that's just the the TV personality in me. Uh, it's, I'm used to being very expressive, and so I just do it with my hands. But a lot of times. Uh, there'll be a, there'll be something in my hand to keep me from doing certain things with my hands, but yeah, it's usually either a pen or a piece of paper or something like that. So no, I'm, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm down with that idea, but I'm half Scottish, half Scandinavian. I do not have any Italian in me. All right. Other people think you're just trying to imitate the, uh, goat sign language translator that the state of Georgia has. Oh, he is, he was on fire yesterday and that's, that's. One of the things that, you know, when you're looking at these press conferences that are with state officials, and this has been, especially with uh, emergencies and, and press conferences that really have uh, a whole lot of import behind them. And I've seen this in a lot of different states, too, uh, especially in the southeast. The the, the interpreters, the, those who are doing uh, the ASL version of the, the press conference, they really get into it. And I think the, the more southern that you see the press conference, the more that they're really getting into it. It's it's a fun watch to see them just go absolutely nuts with their uh, emphasis with their ASL. So you're saying that um, ASL does have a southern accent? I think so. With emphasis, I think I think that it could, yeah. And also within the Northeast, because if you see stuff in like New York State and things like that, I think that you can with the with with the facial expressions. That are attached to the emphasis with ASL. I think that you could sit there and attach a uh, attach a, a vibe to it. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know you could have an accent or any difference with ASL, but I, I did not know that. That's very good. Um. Okay. Uh, Jams wants to know what was in Brian Schmetzer's notebook last night. His takeout order after the match was over. I think he's got people to take care of that for him. He's just sitting there, write it down, hand it, hand it to somebody else, sit there, and it's like, here, take care of this for me. I do that sometimes where I'm taking notes during stuff. I don't do it when I'm calling a game because I, I can't take the yeah. time away. And, and I'm, my memory's pretty good with, with moments in the game I want to talk about at halftime or, you know, I, I have different things, you know, pulled up with when shots happened, with when moments happened. So I can jog my memory that way. Uh, you know, but if you're a coach and, and you see something that you want to talk about at halftime, like you see a, a breakdown with your team in transition or something, I get it. Um, there are a few who do that. There, there are a few who do the notebook thing and write notes and then use it in their halftime speech. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, uh, I've seen Jose do it. And what yep. he'll do is he'll, he'll put his notes down, then he'll put it in his jacket, and then he'll walk inside. So, no, I, yeah, I've, I've always thought that that was like quick notations of things to sit there and it's like, okay, talk about this, 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 and this, close the notebook up, put it away, and walk inside. Yep. Um, okay. We've got more stuff to get into. Uh, we will get into a lot of MLS stuff with Mike Conti here in about 10 minutes. Uh, a lot of teams have made moves. You've got a team that might be changing their name. Uh, Mm. Um, Kefsi brings it up. Let's go ahead and get to this. So, Champions League yesterday in Europe. Uh, we'll we'll talk Zinedine Zidane a little bit, and he's not in a good place at the moment with uh, Real Madrid. People are not happy. Um, they've got a very interesting game coming up. They were just bad in the second half. They were missing people, yes, but five losses in their last eleven. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Porto and Manchester City, uh, Sergio Conceicao and, and Pep Guardiola not really vibing with one another. Uh, I don't think that's the first time either. That's a fun one. Um, Locomotive Moscow was horrendous. Ugh. They started seven defenders. So <laughs> the black helicopter theories were correct about that one with why they were such a big home underdog. Well, they started seven defenders. I don't know why they did that, but anyway. Um, okay. Let's get into a very interesting game in that Real Madrid group 
Borussia Mönchengladbach, Inter Milan. Inter gets a win, which Inter had to get a win. That group will be chaos next week. Uh-huh. But how did Inter get the win? It looked like it was going to be 3-3. There was a, a goal that happened, and it was a goal, yep. and then it was looked at by VAR. Uh, Kefsi said, wondered if the third goal from Gladbach set off any Caden Clark replays in your head. Yeah, oh, it yeah. did. Yeah, it did. Especially when the referee crew got it right. Hmm. I remember saying a lot of those same things on the call. Yep. I remember the referee telling Atlanta United, telling Brad Gazant, I remember people from the professional referees organization explaining that, well, it's only line of sight. That's the only thing that matters. That's all that matters. That's the way we call it. Even though if you do some research and you talk about directives that are given to ARs and are giving, given to referees in these situations, what we complained about with that goal, Caden Clark's goal, that I believe, without going back to look at it, um, I want to say it's Daniel Royer, who was avoiding the shot. Player is avoiding the shot. They're not in the line of sight. Goalkeeper sees the shot coming. But they have to avoid the shot, and they're in an offside position. My argument was that they are an active part of the play. That was the way I explained it that night over and over again <laughs> because we talked about it a lot because it was a big moment. Um, there are some people who said that we were just being sour grapes and people were complaining about it. Well, go watch Borussia Mönchengladbach because that goal was called back for the exact reason we were talking about. Player was avoiding the shot. I think, honestly, that one is more questionable than the Caden Clark one. But both, you have an offside player in the, the, the six, or around the six, the goalkeeper has to wait to see if there's a deflection, which means they are affected. And it was called back in the Champions League. It was not called back here. So that's one that when we talked about referee situations towards the end of the year for Atlanta United, that was one that I would put to the side with a grain of salt because I think it was an interpretation situation. I mean, it is. And, all right, that's the way pros going to call it. That's the way they say they're going to call it. Fine, whatever. Now I'm angrier about it <laughs> yeah. because you had referees yesterday who take who took the look at it, did the VAR situation with it, and they come back and they say, yes, he is impacting the play. And he is. Because the goalkeeper has to wait it out. Yep. And that's what's so frustrating about this. Because there was so much surety of, nope, nope, it's only line of sight. Nope, it's only line of sight. Nope, only line of sight. Well, this is what was said in FIFA's guidance about this situation. Um, the question was, what if a player makes a clear attempt to avoid playing the ball? Which is what happened in both situations. You see a player jump out of the way of the shot. Um, FIFA's offside circular offers advice on this type of situation by adding, and this is in quotes, or making an obvious action which clearly impacts the ability of an opponent to play the ball. And then following up on it, and this is, this is in guidance about it from FIFA. Here is a situation where a player in an offside position makes no attempt at the ball, in fact attempts to avoid to avoid playing the ball. However, his obvious action, bolded, of attempting to avoid the ball clearly impacts, bolded, the defender and the goalkeeper. This is an offside offense. That's what happened. They got it right. They got it right. They got it wrong at the bends and There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and yes, yes, it was Royer, and Royer's uh, activity was more pronounced and more in front of the keeper than it was in the instance from yesterday. I, I, I do not want the in the front of the keeper part to affect any of this. It doesn't matter right. if he's closer to being in front of the keeper. He is 
in a position that I think affects the goalkeeper more, Royer was. Yeah. Right. Although, the one yesterday, I mean, how many times do you see it? A shot comes in and a player jumps and, and you know flicks it with the back heel or whatever. The goalkeeper cannot know in that position yeah. that the attacking player is offside. They know that that player could redirect the shot. They have to stay home. Goalkeepers are taught to stay home. They're taught to play for the deflection. It affects what the goalkeeper does. It's harsh. I totally agree. But a player's in an offside position, and they are impacting the goalkeeper's ability to play the ball. It should be ruled offside. It was yesterday. It was not at the bends. Yes, Kessie, I was not a happy camper. And you shouldn't have been. Hmm. I mean, uh uh-huh, yes. Burns says German newspapers reporting that the call was correct, disagreeing with Marco Ross. And, and yeah, I I understand why he'd be frustrated because it it is a weird situation. But it's 100% right. Mm -hmm. Like, it it is. And and that's – that happened – Pretty early in that game against the Red Bulls, and we showed every replay, and we talked through it, and I thought we broke it down really, really well. And look, those things are tough. It was tough for me, because that's the first time I'd done TV in a couple of years. So working through all of the mechanics with TV to try to explain it, to try to make sure we had it right, to you know make sure we had the right replays, to react to the different angles we're getting... Like, I was so locked in, and I know Kevin was so locked in, and we talked about it a lot afterwards. Like, did we get it right? Did we explain it right? You know, even if we interpreted it wrong, did we explain everything properly and thoroughly? And I thought like we did, and I thought we had it right, and I thought we explained it properly, and that it came down to interpretation. And we felt like, and I was very clear in that I felt like, the referee interpreted the situation at the bends wrong. And I feel like I got a little more backup now from the referees in the Champions League yesterday. Yep. It's and it's just it has to be called that way because the goalkeeper is trapped mm-hmm. in that situation. And what that does in Group B is that means is heading into the last match day in the group stage, all four teams separated by three points. Borussia Mönchengladbach is at eight. Shakhtar and Real Madrid are both at seven. Enter with the win. Their first win in group stage is now at five points. Madness in group B on match day last. Yeah, it's going to be wild because of the way this worked out. Um, A little bit more on this. Byrne says the German chief of refereeing explains it's not line of sight. It's the second criterion. Obvious action influencing the opponent's ability to play the ball. And that is what we hammered and hammered and hammered any explanation of it. And this is why, and, and look, I understand it's so hard with, with referees and dealing with it, and you don't want to constantly complain about referees, but you have to talk about referees. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think the idea that you can't talk about referees is, is false. In this game, they have such an effect on it, and interpretation is so important. But you have to not just say, they got it wrong, they got it right. You have to explain your position. And... I'm not a referee. I, I I did actually get referee certification when I was in high school, um, and I worked a little bit as a referee. It wasn't for me. I didn't enjoy it. It's very, very hard to do. I have a ton of respect for the referees who do it because it is hard work, and, and there's a lot of pressure on you. But there's a lot of pressure on you because your job is so important. And whenever we talk about referees, I try really hard to explain not just what happened, but why I think they got it right or they got it wrong. And this was a situation where we went deep into the weeds on it to explain it. And I just, I I wanted to make that so clear that this is why I think they got it wrong. And now I feel like, okay, that was the situation on the world stage. And they called it the way we thought they should have called it. They called it in the way that I think they interpreted the laws of the game correctly. Um, all right, we are going to save uh, our, our conversation with or, or about Steve Apolinski here in just a bit because Mike Conti has a little bit of limited time today. All right. We're going to get Mike on the line now. Mateo, do your thing. Mateo, do your thing. Let's get Mike Conti with us. 
to talk MLS, to talk uh, MLS Cup playoffs, to talk CONCACAF Champions League. What's up, Mike? What's going on, guys? Not much. I'm yelling about referees again. I know it's something new, but uh, that whole VAR <laughs> situation with Borussia Mönchengladbach, um, I feel vindicated. Oh, yeah, listen, you were never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's... Um, I'm exasperated because um, <laughs> that's a good word for it. The, the, the way that Howard Webb twisted, not twisted, twist is the wrong word. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. But the, the way that Webb explained why that was a good goal, um, I think only offered a partial explanation of what the law was. And, Webb's explanation out of context, just on its own, was probably the acceptable explanation. But, look, I I mean, I'm not nearly as expert as you in this. Um, But I think that was the game I was doing by myself because you were in the TV booth. Yeah, we talked about it in the post I I knew what had happened. Right. Uh, and who was the player who kind of twisted in front of Guzan? Royer. Uh, I, Royer. I can't remember. Royer. It was so long ago. You know, when Royer's in an offside position twisting, uh, I know immediately when I see him twist like that, that, you know, unless there's something behind the goal, a view from behind the goal that that shows that he was clear, clearly and obviously not in Guzan's line of sight, um, I, I know instantly there what, what has occurred and why that is obstruction. And I've only been doing this for a couple of years. So, and that was without you even in the booth with me. So if I can see it, <laughs> surely yeah. everyone else can. Well, they, um, they saw it yesterday. Um, yeah. Feel a little vindicated afterwards. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's a tough job. Yeah. All right. It, it is a tough, tough job. And it has been made even more difficult this year because of the pandemic mm-hmm. and, you know, all, all the things that I think have been disruptive to a referee's schedule. Uh, and, and for that, and I think we're seeing this in all sports, by the way, college football has been a train wreck with officiating this year. Um, college basketball, we're seeing in the very early days of college basketball, the, the quality of officiating is not to its usual standard. Same thing in the NFL. I wonder... You know, have there been recurring trainings that have been disrupted by all of this? Um, You know, has travel and quarantine procedures made it more difficult for referees to prepare going into a game? Uh, It is a difficult job, and it's probably more difficult than usual in 2020. So I don't want to be like, kill the ref, kill the ref. But, man, I mean, we're talking about just repeated decisive mistakes that we're seeing match after match, week after week, not only in Major League Soccer, but in in leagues around the world in all sports. But it just gets really, really frustrating because, look, if that goal's ruled out, Atlanta United might still be playing right now. Now, they, they put themselves in the position where, you know, these decisive calls going against them are going to cost them a trip to the playoffs. But if that goal's ruled out, that ends in a scoreless draw. You know, you're going into Columbus needing not a win um, on decision day. You're needing a draw. And then, you know, if the, the three incidents in the penalty area, of which only one was an actual penalty, if that goes the other way, you're in the playoff. And again, you might still be playing. So, I don't know. You should be vindicated. You should feel vindicated. I, I kind of chuckled when I saw the replay of that on Twitter yesterday because I knew exactly you know, <laughs> I knew exactly what the parallel was. And um, No, I'll tell you how it played out yesterday. It's funny because uh, there were games like all day that I, I was watching, and, and you, know, you have to take care of some stuff. You have to run around, so I had to run to the store. Um, so... As I'm coming out of the store, I immediately get a text from Kevin Egan. <laughs> right. Did you see that? Did you see that? <laughs> and, and then I pull the video up, and, and I'm yelling in my car about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. I'll tell you, um, you know, I, I hope the, the national people who were, um, 
not in alignment with what you and Kevin were saying on the TV broadcast you know. that day. Uh, I, I hope there's an acknowledgement of that. Or no. An apology. No. <laughs> no. no. There, will, there will never be that. I just hope they think about the interpretation. Because that's the biggest thing to me is well, goalkeepers are, are stuck in that spot. And, and you're, right. you're trying to create these, these laws to make the game fair. And in that case, it's not fair. It is an advantage for an offside player to affect the play. And they're absolutely affecting the play because the goalkeeper has to wait for the rebound. There's no way the goalkeeper can know the player's offside. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, you, don't know, you don't know the offside in a position you know, where you're, you're looking at the opposite goal. Uh, the offside is only really visible if you're on the touchline. Yeah. We could go on and on about pro referees. We're not. They, they've actually done pretty well in the postseason. I've been pretty. Uh, aside from the one crew that got banned for the rest of the postseason for but, but that mis- mismanaging one, the end of the Orlando New York City match. That's different. And, and <laughs> the, the reason I'll say it's different, like, I think the way they've called games, they've done a really good job. This I, season. Agree. I agree. I, that one, I think they should have red carded who on with the first shoulder. Uh, that's yeah, my yeah. issue on the field. They screwed up the mechanics of that completely. And that's the problem where, like, I'm glad that Pro was strong on them for screwing up the mechanics and and not getting that part of the job right. I wish they were harder on referees when they mismanage games. Not mechanics, not procedures, but actual game management. Pro needs to be harder on referees when those mistakes happen. Right, and I also... It's one of those things where, again, like I applaud them for being transparent. I think it was Alan Chapman's crew, right, that that got yeah. banned, or the, yeah. the uh, Chapman was the the center. center right? He was yeah. the center, whoever yeah. he was working with. Um, you know, look, it, it's another deal where I do ap- I applaud Pro for being very transparent the way they handled that, uh, in the same way that they were very transparent about um, the incident, the or- Orlando Atlanta match where Brooks Lennon got kicked in the back of the head. Um, you know, we can point to those instances and say, well, it, good, pros being transparent. But then on the other hand, you know, we learn after the fact that pro acknowledged an oopsie and not sending off Figal down in Miami, but they didn't publicly acknowledge that. Um, and, and we never found out what happened to that fourth official in the Atlanta <laughs> D.C. match. Yeah. Where the uh, the outside agent was allowed onto the pitch, the mm-hmm. so agent. you know I, I feel like it's fair to applaud Pro for their transparency, but I also think it's fair to call them out for a lack of transparency. Oh, no question. Sure. You know, um, we've seen instances of both. I really do wonder what happened to that fourth. Uh, in that Atlanta, I didn't DC go back match. and look at like other assignments. To, He's to never worked check. another match. I, okay. I know that. You did I, check I've that. looked back too. I, I'll bet but. you we get a quiet press release at some point. Yeah. Um, middle of like about like a the middle of February and, or yeah. something. Well, like he got a, a fine DC too. That's the yeah. other thing. Like, it, didn't they fine Houston for something similar a couple of years ago? Uh, Dallas. Yeah. Or Dallas. Yeah, yeah they, they yeah. fined him 100000 Um Most of it was GAM, uh, but some of it was straight cash. I think it was 25000 straight cash. Right, right. Burned with oh, a well. good point on, on the situation from yesterday, and then we'll move on. He says, the, the, to me, the media reaction here versus the media reaction in Germany, because this happened to, to Mölchen Gladbach yesterday, so that's the most telling. The MLS mm-hmm. punditry never actually researched it and mindlessly repeated an incorrect interpretation, making yeah. fun of Atlanta United's mm-hmm. fans. Over there, the headline in the most influential soccer magazine of the country is "Why the Third Goal Correctly Didn't Count." Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, again, um, I, I think there's a general attitude among some with national platforms that by antagonizing Atlanta's fan base, they somehow will get more interaction. Yeah. I Bottom hate, line. Uh, I hate to see it, say it, but and, and maybe it's a correct thought, um, but that seems to be the attitude of some. I'm not going to name names. No. But um, It happens. You know, that, it happens far too often. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, uh, whatever. I'm, I, I don't. Don't let me go down this wormhole anymore. <laughs> okay, I'm we're good. Like I did last year. I don't want to do that. All right, so we'll give you a different wormhole. Uh, yesterday, Greg Vanny 
Yeah. No, no longer is going to be, no longer is in charge at uh, Toronto FC. Now Vanny is in play and Toronto is in play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a really good job up in Toronto is in play. A really, really good job. Uh, and Vanny is, I think, instantly now among managers with MLS experience. I mean, he's right at the top of the list. If you want to hire a manager with MLS experience, this is why I think the the criticism of the pains of Atlanta United search, I don't know if DC is getting criticized in the same way as Atlanta or if Galaxy is getting criticized in the same way. No, there's rumors but, on those. Remember? Yeah. It's just because there's okay. no rumors here. That's why everybody's upset. Oh. Oh, yeah. A lack of information. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Just want to uh, clarify. <laughs> a lack of know. information goes to the the <laughs> the inverse proportion of the the amount of uh, public discussion. Well, you know, one of the interesting things that's in play now is, I guess Schmetzer is going to be out of contract in Seattle. Yep. Wasn't Vanny on Seattle's TV broadcast like a decade ago? Uh, yeah. Um. I think if you're looking for ties, you got to look harder at L.A. Well, obviously. I, I think yeah, that's I mean. a really tenuous one with Seattle. Because I think it was like one year when Vanny first uh, retired. and Yeah. I've just I've seen it before. Like, Eddie Olchek was the Penguins TV yeah. analyst, and then suddenly he was coaching the Penguins. Right. Larry Durker was the Astros TV analyst, and suddenly he was managing the Astros. Oh, Ray Hudson right. with uh, Miami Fusion, right. and then he, he went to the bench to manage Miami I mean, Fusion. I mean, Jason, you don't have to say if, if you feel weird about it, but if Atlanta United has asked you or if they put out any feelers for you, you know, you could break some news here on, on soccer down here. I mean, are you in the candidate pool for Atlanta United? Uh, you're You'd gonna have, have to, talk to discuss to my people it with his agent, that. I guess. Yeah, I, I am. I am definitely not. Okay, <laughs> I'm sure. definitely because there is precedent for it, and I think you do a great job. I don't have my coaching uh, certification, so I, I would not be allowed to do that. Well, that that's not a deal breaker necessarily. I mean, I haven't we had instances where guys have been hired and then they go get their license? Yeah, but I don't have enough to jump that line fast enough because All you right. got to get well, to the pro license pretty fast. Do me a favor. If they call you, let me know because. I, 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 <laughs> You know, I think he'd be a great coach, but I, I'm not going to no. let you go out of the booth that easily. Yeah, so really. Darren and I, I mean, are you got have stoppage time, man. You got to you got to make sure that you well, can, stoppage can you time imagine? Time. I mean, our, we have very strong numbers for stoppage time already, but can you imagine where it would go <laughs> if I had the active <laughs> sitting Atlanta United head coach every week on stoppage time? That'd be epic. Yeah. Idea, um, yeah. Anyhow, Vanny, look. I don't know where things are with Atlanta United. I don't know where things are with DC. I don't know where things are with Galaxy. I don't know where things are with Seattle. Uh, Greg Vanny has been a winner in MLS. And I I just want to say this. I don't know if he's under consideration in Atlanta or not. I don't know if Atlanta is too far down the road with someone else. I don't know if they're really, really close with someone. We, We just don't hear the rumors. But for the subset of Atlanta United supporters who feel like you need to bring in a South American manager because Atlanta United's ambition is not just to win MLS, but to win global competitions, I would just say this. Vanny's record in the CONCACAF Champions League is solid. And Mm -hmm. what he almost pulled off two years ago with a patchwork bubble gum and duct tape and paperclip lineup for an injury depleted Toronto team. Uh, They were very, very close to winning the CONCACAF Champions League in 2018. So I I would just say if you're looking for someone who has proven that he can have success in global competitions, Vinny has shown me that, in my opinion. I don't know if he's under consideration in Atlanta. I don't know if he's under consideration in D.C. or L.A. Galaxy or anywhere else. Um, But if you're looking for someone who's been a winner in MLS and has been solid in global competitions, Greg Manny checks those two boxes. Uh TNT Sports out of Argentina following up on the news last night about Carlos Quiroz uh, leaving the Colombian national team. The primary candidate to replace him? Matias Almeida. Almeida is getting linked 
everywhere right now. Yeah, he really is. Uh-huh. Uh, Monterey, and, and he yet, is still reportedly the number one. He is still the manager of the San Jose Earthquakes, is he not? He's that, not out of contract. That is he's correct. A, well, that's a that's a dilly of a pickle uh, for he's, <laughs> everyone involved. He's going to have a uh, lot yeah. of. He's linked to like every club in Brazil as well. But that I think everybody is linked to every club at Brazil at all times. Pretty much. Um, pretty much. Colombia now has come up. Monterey. He is still front of mind there. So, um, well, there are a lot of yep. good jobs out there. I mean, that there that's are. the other thing too. Um, I like Almeida a lot, and, and he plays that up tempo, free style. Uh, Quakes have been very, very fun to watch. Has Almeida had enough success with the Earthquakes um, to justify the level of interest that he's getting globally? I, I think they'll, that they'll could look be at discussed. the Chivas. The, they'll, they'll say he won a league title. He won a Concacaf title. He did. Um, he did. The, yeah. I mean, he's done. I think people understand, and and he was very smart in his postseason comment about you know there's no investment here. So he he kind of created an excuse, and and it's a valid one. It's not a it's not a made up one. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of talent to work with, and I think he's taken it as far as he can. The question it seems he has, and the question it seems Wondolowski has, is mm-hmm. is there going to be some investment? Because if not, mm-hmm. do we want to do this again here? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's a great question, um, and I, I think what ends up happening with Almeida, I, I think, will be either an indictment or or a credit to San Jose. I mean, if they come up with what it's going to take to keep them, uh, that's a pretty strong signal from San Jose ownership that, that they are going to take this seriously. They won't keep him if they don't promise they're going to spend some money. If he, yeah. if he goes back, San Jose is going to spend some money in January. Yeah. No, it, it it's, um, Santa, I mean, they're dealing with a lot right now out in San Jose. I mean, they're, they're dealing with the, If they were in the CONCACAF Champions League right now, they wouldn't be allowed to train in their home facility um, because Santa Clara County has completely locked up everything. Yep. Um, you know, they're, they're probably looking at a very, very grim situation going into next season where they are probably the least likely of the 27 clubs in this league to have fans at all next year. Um, so that that complicates that entire conversation, I would think, for the earthquakes. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's any less grim elsewhere. Well, and for Toronto FC and for the other Canadian yeah. clubs. Yeah, I mean, boy, you would hope by March, you know, because then there, there's going to be impacts with the Blue Jays. You know, the Raptors have only committed to Tampa through the beginning of March. I mean, I think there's... There's some optimism with, um, you know, the Raptors and the Blue Jays that they'll loosen that up a little bit once the vaccine starts really going in a couple weeks and and into the first quarter of 2021. But, yeah, I mean, that's a big problem, too. But, you know, speaking of Toronto, I think Tor- if Atlanta – I mean, really, you've got three excellent MLS jobs that are open right now. Uh, if Atlanta's 1A – Toronto's probably 1B and Galaxy is 1C. I mean, these are three really choice, prime opportunities in this league right now. Uh, and if you are a managerial free agent, this is probably a pretty good position to be in right now because you have three ambitious clubs that could be pulled into uh, a little bit of a bidding situation, which would give the leverage to the candidate. Uh, so it's going to be a fascinating next couple weeks. It, you don't have really a ton of time. I mean, you probably have about a month, maybe a month and a half, before you're starting to think about opening your 2021 training camp. Yeah. Month and a half if you're not in CONCACAF, which I guess Atlanta, Toronto, and Galaxy all are not. Am I correct on that? All three of them are not? Uh, Toronto could be... They've got oh, the right. Canadian Championship Cup final. Thing, they? they have to play the final, um, yeah. which I think is set for January. So yeah. they'll be in camp maybe a little bit earlier because of that to begin with. Right. Yeah. But Galaxy and Atlanta are not. So right. you're probably looking at, I don't know, but mid to late January when you're going to be opening camp. So, I mean, I guess you still have time. But, again, I mean, Vanny is going to be 
he'll be linked to everything and everyone now because he, he's the top coaching candidate with MLS experience that's out there at the moment. Uh, did you catch uh, the action yeah. last night? Yeah. I did, yeah. I mean, Seattle's rolling right now. Uh, I, I did not have Shane O'Brien in the uh, the goal-scoring pool last night. I'll, or is it O'Brien or O'Neal? O'Neal. Oh, Shane O'Neal. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. I don't. I was reading a story about uh, Pat Patterson dying today. And yeah, the last name o, The last name O'Brien has been stuck in my mind. Excuse me. Shane O'Neal. It certainly didn't have Shane O'Neal. I don't even know his last name. Uh, in my goal-scoring Shane! pool. Shane! Now, look, Seattle's rolling. Um, they'll, you know, let's see if they have to go to Kansas City now or if Minnesota will come there. Uh, but, boy, oh, boy. Uh, Brian Schmetzer knows how to get it done in the playoffs. Does he not? Mm-hmm. He does. He, yeah, I'm he right just, to, I'm I mean, right it's, with it. it's not always pretty, but he just gets it done. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. Like, they're not always the most fun to watch in the regular season and sometimes they play very very cynically and very very negatively but it gets you results and um you know they're they're two steps away from repeating you got to give them a lot of credit and and they've been solid all year they you know the one thing about seattle is as i perceive them in the west and obviously i didn't watch the western conference teams incredibly closely this year because Atlanta wasn't going to play any of them other than Dallas. Um, Seattle just it feels like they've been very, very consistent this year. They never got super cold. They never got super hot. They, they've just been very, very consistent. And I think that's something you can say for them really over the last two years. 2018 was a little different. They were very, very cold until July, and then they got really, really hot once they brought in Raul Rui Diaz. Uh, that was 2018. In 2019, they were just very, very solid. And I I thought last year, I know a lot of people thought I was crazy for saying it. You know, having seen LAFC and Seattle, both in person, both in their home parks last year, I thought Seattle was better than LAFC last year. You know, LAFC, you know, 70-some points and, you know, had all the historical statistics. But I just thought Seattle was better by my eye test. Um and, and, you know, that's measuring them against a common opponent. So I'm not really surprised to see them in this spot. I did think Portland would be the Western Conference champion. Obviously, they're out. I thought it would be Philly or Nashville on the East. Obviously, they're out. So that shows you how much I know. But, um, I think everybody's I, in the same boat. <laughs> but but if I'm putting money on, on any of the five teams left right now, it's Seattle. They're my first choice Yeah, to go the rest of the way. They have to be. Okay, I think we've got you for 60 more seconds, so I need your take on this rumor out of Montreal that they are going to change their name it. from the impact <laughs> to Montreal Why? FC. Why? Why would they do it? Why? I mean, they, look, I know some people have said that the impact, it carries kind of a minor league connotation because Montreal was not in the first division and they were called the impact, but... I hate it. They, they've got a unique brand. They've got a unique logo. And I wish MLS teams would, it, the, the ones that have actual, uh, if you will, mascots or monikers, would not shy away from that and go to the generic name of city FC or name of city SC. Let's try. I, why can't we be a little bit different in MLS? I don't think that's a bad thing. Let's embrace being different. I hate it. And, you know, now you're going to have Toronto FC and Montreal FC. Why why can't we try to do something different? I, I don't get it. I don't that's either. Two cents. I, I hate it. I don't either. Let's embrace no being different. Everyone makes fun of MLS for being a different kind of weird league. Let's embrace it rather than trying to be homogenous. Fully support it. Fully support what, what said. you're saying. Yes. Um, we got stoppage time, 2 o'clock, correct? Yeah, thanks. I, I got to get on a conference call with Bogdan Bogdanovich, so that's why I have to come oh, very nice. today. I appreciate, appreciate you understanding. But, yeah, we'll be on at 2 o'clock on the 92.9 The Game Facebook page. Excellent. Talk to you then. All right, guys. Tell Bogdan we said hello. Oh, yes. I will. I'll see <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike Conti, 929 on Twitter. Make sure you're following Mike. Um, there is a lot of backlash about this proposed thing in Montreal. 
uh, we'll we'll keep you posted on that. I know the uh, supporters group up there, the the Montreal Ultras or Ultras de Montreal. I'm not sure exactly how they're titled. They've issued a statement. There will be more. It, it, the The team started 1993. You know, I mean, yes, it sounded like a team from the 90s when it was named because it was named in the 90s. Um, they've gotten past that. And even the minor league moniker idea, they've gotten past that because you're you're almost 10 years into your MLS run. You know, like it's it's a team with history. The name has history. That's that park. One of my favorite things about Stad Saputo is where we go for our pregame meal. It's like their trophy room and they've got a ton of trophies. And I mean, trophies from that they've won on the field. They've got a lot of old jerseys, you know, pennants from international exhibitions like the club has history. Don't throw that away for something generic. Like the, yeah. it, it makes no sense. So, I really hope they don't go down that road. I don't understand why they would. I, I don't get the benefit to it. You know, I mean, it's not the Dallas Burn changing their name to FC Dallas like five years into their existence when right. Dallas Burn was a pretty bad name. It was. This is almost thirty years into your existence. There's no need to change it now. Embrace the history. It is the history. I mean, you've got, like, naming conventions. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of teams around the world that are city name FC or FC city name. That's fine. You also have, and I think everybody, when they talk about this is what real soccer is, they look to Europe. They don't look to South America. And in South America, I mean, you've got all kinds of different team names. You've got Newell's Old Boys in Argentina. I mean, and it has a history. It has a name. It was literally like he was a, a teacher, and it was like his students' team at first. There's heritage there. Um, you have all kinds of different team names. You have Wanderers in, in Montevideo in Uruguay. Like, they have names that have kind of name and mascot. They have names that have nothing to do with the city. They have names that are the city. I mean, it's just... Yeah. It's the team name, and once it gets to a certain point, I think you're foolish to change it. And I think Montreal is way past that point. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously looking at it in the most crass way possible, what it does is it creates another revenue stream for Joey Saputo with new gear, with new branding, with all this new stuff that people can buy, and then you can sit there and, Uh, Well, you know, you can still remember the past and you can still continue to buy your Montreal Impact stuff over here while we're now Montreal FC. Hey, a couple things. Joey Saputo is not making the day-to-day decisions anymore in Montreal. That needs to be understood. So don't throw Joey under the bus here. Um, He's taken a step back. I think it's uh, Gilmore, if I remember right, who is overseeing the Impact side of things. I think Saputo is more involved on the Bologna side in Serie A. Um, I do not think it's about merchandising. I think I don't think that's the issue here. I, I don't know what the issue is. I mean, yeah. I don't. You're not going to sell enough merchandise with a generic name to make up for throwing away the history of it. Like that's the thing. And and Bart says clearly, there's been a ton of market research to show that fans respond well to City FC or City City FC, et cetera, et cetera. United throwing in. So I don't know who's doing this research, but it's likely one or two firms that are collecting the data that shows this. It's really unfortunate that some of the names are, are so bland. I go back and forth, and I think Montreal's a different situation. So from a Charlotte one, from an Austin one, from Atlanta United, other teams, if it is brand new and you create that name and you create a brand around it, I don't have a problem. Um, and I, I'll repeat the story that I've said many times. Talking to non-soccer fans, when they heard the name Atlanta United, they said that sounds like a soccer team. Whereas Atlanta Silverbacks sounded like an arena football team to people. Yeah. So I get that. And when you're starting from, from scratch, you can create a brand around it. You know, it's the colors. It's the, the stripes here. Um, with Austin, it, it's the colors because that green is so unique. Uh, it's the stripes for them, too. Uh, but it's the tree, you know. Like with Charlotte, it's the crown. Like there, there's things you can do around it. And other, like, nicknames and things will evolve. But Montreal's not that. Montreal's not starting from scratch. They have history. Montreal Impact might have sounded very 90s when it was created. 
And maybe in the early 2000s, it felt a little dated. We're in 2020 now. You've had history with championships in the second division with that name. You've had you know amazing moments in the first division with that name. Um, it doesn't make any sense to throw it away. Like if they were starting fresh and they said we're going to be Montreal FC or FC Montreal or whatever, okay. But you're not. You're you're throwing right. away. You're making it worse now. If you start generic and build a brand off of it, fine. If you have a brand and you trash it and you go generic and then you have to build a brand off of the generic name, you're creating a lot of work for yourself. It's it's pointless to me. So yeah. I hope they don't do it. I hope this has just been floated out there. We'll see. We will see what happens. Um, we got a ton of stuff to get to. I'm going to run through a lot of things kind of quickly here. If you guys have questions, throw them into us. Uh, on Twitch Pitch, on Twitter, at Soccer Down Here. Uh, you can send us an email as well. I will check that before we wrap. Soccer Down Here at Gmail. Um, Philadelphia announced their roster moves just a little bit ago. Not any massive surprises. Um, Warren Creval, his option was declined. Local guy. Andrew Vooten had a very poor tenure in Philadelphia. Um, I don't believe he scored a goal, or if he did, he, he scored one. Um, it was not good for Andrew Vooten in Philadelphia. Uh, his option was not picked up. Uh, they did pick up the option on Il Cino, so Super Sub Il Cino will be back for the Philadelphia Union. Other teams that have made announcements, uh, BWP, Bradley Wright Phillips, Declined option yesterday by LAFC. They are negotiating a new deal. There's already been talk about he could end up anywhere and everywhere. And I think the question is going to be, does he see himself as a starter or not? And I think he does, based off comments he made all year. I don't know how many teams are going to give him starting minutes. And that's going to be the question. Um, Andy Nahar, his option was also declined, and he never got fit for them. They declined the purchase option on uh, Jesus Murillo as well, the Independiente Medellin center back that they brought in at the very end of the season after they finally decided to replace a center back, and they didn't even pick up the purchase option on him. So I have no idea what LAFC did strategy-wise after trading Walker Zimmerman. Houston Dynamo um, getting rid of a lot of their older players, Bonyet Garcia, who gave them so many games and so many years, Minor Figueroa, who'd come over from Dallas, Tomas Martinez, DP, um, his option was declined. They got 22 players under contract for 21. Very young group. This will be the year that I think Tab Ramos kind of puts his stamp on what the Houston Dynamo are. Uh, Montreal signed the Canadian left back that we mentioned yesterday, uh, Zorhan Bassong. Um, He has just joined the Canadian national team. Two-year contract, two option years. He can play anywhere on the back line. It's a big pickup for them with Yuka Rayatala not coming back. Uh, Vancouver says they want to invest in a designated player, a playmaker, an attacking midfielder. Uh, they've been very clear in this. Axel Schuster said they have to do this. They put pressure on this because we want to invest in a designated player. Um, keep an eye on Vancouver. Going big with some spending. Looks like Chicago are getting Bulgarian U21 international Stanislav Ivanovov. I- Ivanov. He is a winger with Levski right now. He's going to sign a pre-contract to join as a free agent in the summer. It's good business. Free transfer. Uh, You get him in the summer. Good business for Chicago. Frankie Amaya, who we were very happy about getting into the national team, tested positive. He's been removed. They did bring in Andres Perea from Orlando, and I really like that call-up. One, it's easy because he's right there. Um, Two, he is a dual national, uh, Colombian, but he was born in Tampa. And I like his game. Um, I think that was a great pickup for Orlando to bring Perea in. And now you get a chance to see him in a national team situation. He is young. He could be part of the Olympic squad. I like that pickup. Also, Greg Berhalter said that Jackson Yule will be joining the camp. We had wondered why he wasn't there. He's joining. They are planning a January camp, and they will have a game at the end of that camp. I'm assuming it'll look somewhat similar to what we're seeing right now. This kind of camp, maybe some of the... Maybe more veterans, or maybe it goes even more to the U23 to try to solidify that Olympic uh, qualifying squad. 
Uh, we'll get into the U.S. women's national team in, in just a minute because there's a lot to touch on there. There was a, a big announcement yesterday that was not a shock. Um, Abby asks about Bello on that U.S. men's national t- team list and why wasn't he there. We don't know. We don't know what the explanation was. Um, he had been uh, rumored, uh, according to Joe Patrick, that he was going to be part of that squad. Joe said he had sources that said Bello was going to be called up. He wasn't. No New York City players were called up either. They both have CONCACAF. So I don't think any LAFC players were called up either. So I guess that makes sense that you're not calling up any CONCACAF players because they play CONCACAF the next week. Um, the clubs could have declined the call-ups. We don't know. Burhalter didn't say. The clubs haven't said. That's where it's at right now. Um, new potential Champions League format in Europe. And, and this is weird i guess in some sports it's not weird um and i've heard of this swiss model or swiss system before what you you, what you never heard of this or you have heard of this no i have not heard of this you you gave me a crazy look um the way this would work so it's a way to get more games in the champions league which you know they're trying to do to prevent a breakaway and to make more money so you wouldn't have the first seed, second seed, third seed, fourth seed, four team groups. You play everybody in the group home and away. It wouldn't be set that way. You would play 10 games in a Champions League season. It's similar to what uh, the Heineken Champions Cup uses in rugby. I've seen other systems that do it. Um, the 32 teams would be separated into first, second, third, and fourth seeds. So you would be tagged as a, a one seed, a two seed, a three seed, a four seed. You're not going to be drawn into separate groups. You're all in one division. You don't play everybody. You do a draw to determine ten opponents. Five home, five away. A top seeded team, for instance, would play two other top seeds, three from pot two, three from pot three, two from pot four. It's one big league table, and the top half would go into the knockout phase. 17 to 24 would go into the Europa League. So it's a way to get more Champions League games without changing the structure. You know, we've talked about, do they do eight-team groups? You know, do they do six-team groups? You know, how do they do it? They could do six-team groups and get ten games, and it'd be a very simple home and away. This would create a variety of opponents. Um, it feels a little gimmicky. I just wonder if people would, would get behind it. I think it might be easier to do, you know, groups of six. I don't know, but this is what's being talked about now. They're, they're going to do something because of that, uh, super league conversation. They'll do something to get more games in champions league. There's no question around that, but how they do it is a big question. There's a lot of this kind of stuff going on right now in terms of planning for the future. Uh, There was a big announcement yesterday about what player uh, recruitment and approval processes will look like for work permits post-Brexit. Now you're starting to hear in an FA and a a French licensed agent, uh, Jennifer Mendelevich, said that English clubs are looking at buying teams in Holland or France. Because that way, they're not just limited to purchasing young English players. They could have players come through their sister club. They could go purchase whoever they want, bring them through that club. When they get to 18, then bring them to England. That's going to get weird. Um, In the Republic of Ireland, which it's not part of the UK, they're trying to figure out would the 16 to 18-year-old Irish players be eligible to be signed post-Brexit. And Technically, they shouldn't be, but they're working under the understanding that they would be. I don't know. They could sign European European Union players who were under the age of 18 because of the commonality of the European Union. Post-Brexit, they cannot. So that's going to change the way teams recruit a lot. It's going to get really interesting. The sister club idea, I think, will definitely happen more, whether it's outright purchases or if it's more partnerships or ownership stakes or whatever. But your Red Bulls, do they get involved in England? City Football Group is in a great spot because they've got teams that they can do this with. 
you're going to see more of that. You know, who does uh, Fenway Sports Group go look to buy? Because it would make a lot of sense for Liverpool yep. to have a sister club elsewhere in the world where they could go recruit you know, the best young talent, bring it in, and then when it's time per you know, post-Brexit rules, they could bring them in. So keep an eye on that. Uh, there's a great article at The Athletic from Stuart James about how many players are going into the last year of their contract and what those negotiations are looking like right now. Because, again, this January market's going to be crazy. You've got a lot of big names who could sign pre-contracts with other teams in January. They're coming in with actually asking for big raises. And you hear that, and you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Everybody's losing money. Why would you do that? You're Sergio Aguero, right? He's one who was mentioned. You are making, uh, I don't know what he's making, 50,000 pounds a week. We'll just throw that as a generic number. He goes in and says, I could sign a pre-contract elsewhere in January. I will sign a new contract with you if you pay me 100,000 pounds per week. And it's like, well, why would we double your salary right now or we're losing money? Because it's probably going to cost you 30, 40, 50 million pounds to go sign a replacement for me. So I got you over a barrel right now. So you, you want to have something guaranteed? Sign me and pay me a big raise. Or you better go get the replacement signing right. And that's the challenge. And that's when you get into, do you keep guys? Do you let guys go? Do you shake it up? Do you not shake it up? It's a balance. It's tough. And the market is going to be really weird for some of these situations in January. I think weirder than normal. But it's a great article from Stuart James at The Athletic. Highly recommended. Go check that out. Um, what do you want to get into next? Because we've got a ton of different things. You can call it wherever you see it. Do uh, you want to get into the women's national team? Yeah, let's try to make sense of this because there was the announcement of a settlement yesterday. And initially, I think a lot of people got very excited thinking all this was over. It's not over yet. They reached a settlement. The national team players and the U.S. Soccer Federation reached the settlement over the working conditions side of it. So they agreed to implement, quote, various policies related to hotel accommodations, staffing, game venues, and travel that put the women's team on level terms with the men. Should have been done a long time ago. Good job to get it done now. Judge has got to approve the proposal because this was about to go to trial. Um, it's about a month before it was set to go to trial. Okay. Looks like everything's on the same page there. It's good work from Cindy Parlo Cohn, the president of U.S. Soccer. Now, this is unrelated to the wage discrimination side of things. Completely separate. You know, that was dismissed in May. The players have said they plan to appeal, but they wanted to get this part resolved first. An appeal won't be heard for months. Now, that issue is very complicated because, and we've talked about it, the men are paid individual appearances, performances, performance bonuses, etc. The women opted, and this was their decision, for a pay structure that had more security because it had annual salary, child care benefits, severance pay, et cetera. The women are treated more as, employees isn't the right word, as treated as like the national team is a club team in the way that they are treated by the federation. The men are not. The men don't get a salary. The men don't get those things. That was a decision that the women made. Now, when you went and did the math in the suit, and this is why it was dismissed, the idea about equal pay the women actually made more money in the segment of time that they were uh, alleging they, it wasn't equal pay. They made more money in total than the men did. Now, there's arguments about what should have been included, what shouldn't have been included. But what it came down to, and I'm, I'm surprised this wasn't talked about very much yesterday, uh, because Cindy Parlo Cohn's quote is, is pretty clear about what this is coming down to now. Because I've wondered, you know, is it down to do they want the same system as the men? Um, which they didn't want, do they want that now? Just make everything equal, guaranteed, no problems. The question is going to be FIFA bonuses. Because FIFA, for example, the last Men's World Cup winner, FIFA paid France, I think it was $36 million, or $38 million. The last Women's World Cup winner, the United States, the U.S. Federation was paid $4 million. 
that's from FIFA based off what they make for the tournament, based off their win bonuses. Now, they've said they're going to double the women's thing and you know, spend more money and invest more money on the women's game. They need to, absolutely. There are differences in the revenue between the two tournaments. There, there's no way around that. What are the differences? It's hard because of the way they sell stuff. It's all lumped together. There's a lot for them to figure out to equalize that. But that has nothing to do with U.S. soccer. U.S. soccer gets that money. They don't have any say over how much they get for winning one and not winning the other. There's nothing they can do. This is what Cindy Parlo Cohn said about this this element of the situation. And this is the the compensation side. Talking about the, the women's players said, Unfortunately, they didn't want to negotiate unless the back pay issue was resolved first. Most of the players' claims are tied to prize money for winning the World Cup, which they accomplished in 2015 and 2019. However, prize money is controlled by FIFA, soccer's global governing body. We've offered them the same contracts as the men for all games that are controlled by U.S. soccer. But unfortunately, the response has been that they didn't want to negotiate with U.S. soccer unless U.S. soccer was willing to make up the FIFA World Cup prize money. Cohn said, it just isn't possible from U.S. soccer's standpoint, to make that up. Even pre-COVID, this would be devastating to our budget and to our programming. But given COVID, not to be overly dramatic, it would likely bankrupt the Federation. It would have before, I think. Because, I mean, you're having to make up because FIFA pays out money differently, which has nothing to do with the Federation. You would be having to make up you know, I don't know what the difference was for the previous World Cup cycle, but for this last one, you're, you're having to make up over $30 million. Um, you don't have $30 million lying around. You'd have to cut programming. Like, it's, it is a nonprofit. Yes, they had a surplus from the 2016 Copa America Centenario. Nonprofits aren't run to pay dividends to people. They're run as a nonprofit doesn't mean you don't have money in the bank because you have to be ready for a rainy day like a global pandemic. I th- and this has not been talked about in that way. I think, I think Cohn's quote is, is incredibly clear here. The women negotiated a different pay structure. That part doesn't seem to be the issue anymore. That was one question I had. Are they going to accept what the men get, which is no salary, but more per game, would the women accept that? That would lose some of the security they have. Do they feel like the club game has improved enough to where they can get that security from the NWSL and from overseas? Maybe. Um, but the bonus thing, that there's nothing U.S. soccer can do. Uh, the only thing I can see to resolve it would be the same percentage of the bonus the players would get. Because the bonus is outside a U.S. soccer situation. It's not a good look for the U.S. women's national team, in my opinion. And I know that that's a, a touchy subject, and that's, that gets people riled up. Th- this would bankrupt the Federation. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. there's just no way around it. So it's not just, you know, the U.S. women that are affected by this. It's, you know, the, all the other teams, all the youth national teams, everything that goes out, coaching education, referee education, all of it would be affected by this. And it's not you. This part is not U.S. Soccer's fault. Now, U.S. Soccer put themselves in this situation by not being intelligent in the way that things were structured. They opened the door to this. No question about it for me. There should have never been a question about different per diems. There should have never been a question about different amount of charter flights. There should have never been a question about any of that. That stuff should have always been equal. Whoever screwed that up was incredibly sloppy and opened the door to this. The equal pay outside of the bonus structure should have been resolved a long time ago. And if the women want to be paid in a different manner, the amount of money should be the same. The bucket of money should be the same. If they want it paid out, more salary, less per game, less performance bonus, okay, that's fine. Whatever the federation commits to the men... That's the amount they're going to commit to the women. They can negotiate how it gets paid out. No problem with that. The bonus coming in for performance from outside, from FIFA, there's nothing the Federation can do there except lobby 
for those numbers to increase or to be more equal, but they don't control it. And they shouldn't be punished for that part. So this doesn't look good. And, and I'm very sure that Cindy Parlo Cohn did not want to say things in that way. She's a former women's national team player. She understands it. She can fix it because she knows what they're saying, why they're saying it. She knows how it's been. She's the perfect person to get this stuff resolved, in my opinion. I think this is it's very good for U.S. soccer that she's there. But this is a bad look for the women's national team because you're fighting something that is not the Federation's fault here. And your last suit was very poorly planned because the amount of money was not different for the men in that time period. The women actually made more in that time period. The suit should have been structured differently. Could you have found a cycle recently where, you know, and you got to compare. It's tough because it's not year to year. The women's World Cups are a year after the men's, and you got to look at a cycle. But could you have found a recent cycle where the men made more? Probably. But you didn't in your lawsuit. I mean, that, that's on your lawyers. Um, everything needs to be equal. This has to be understood. But it can't be equal in this standpoint because the money coming in is not equal. There's not a justifiable argument for me that, okay, if the men, let's say the men win the World Cup and out of that $36 million, the men's players would divide up 20. I'm just making up a number. I don't know what the the actual negotiated number is. Okay. Okay. You can't give the, the women 20 out of four. Yeah. It's not there. So uh, that's not the Federation being wrong. I don't think. I don't know. Um, it's, it's not helping at this point. And look, maybe this is the way to get it all sorted out is, is the pandemic in a lot of ways. It's, it's, look, we're in a different world now. Mm-hmm. We've got to move forward differently. I know this is what you said. We're going to work with FIFA. We're going to push FIFA. We're going to lobby FIFA. We're going to say, as Bart says, that you know the Women's World Cup is, is you know successful and growing because of the U.S. women. You should put more money into it. We're going to do all that. Totally agree with that. But we're going to give you whatever percentage of the win bonus that the Federation gets, we're going to give you the same percentage that the men would get. We can't yeah. control the bucket. Right. We can't control that bucket. Everything else, per diem, everything else should be the same. I, I do worry that the Federation will be backed into a corner because I don't think it's the right way for the way the women's game is structured to take away salaries, to take away all of those extra things that they negotiated. But I, I have a concern that the Federation is going to be backed into a corner legally because of this stuff to say, we can't do that because we don't do it for the men. Right. Right. We have to give you the exact same deal that we have for the men, which is no salary, which is no severance, which is no child care benefit. Now, that might be a different one because of of gender laws, and I get that. But the salary part is the big deal because the the men can make what Christian Pulisic is making at Chelsea. The women do not. That's why the Federation making up the salary was a very big deal. That's why the, the NWSL has been tied to all of this as well and, and securing that league's future. I worry that the Federation is going to get backed into a corner in some of this stuff, and it's actually going to get worse and not better because of some of this. They've all got to sit down, and the men need to sit down too. The men, their players' association, the women, their players' association, the leaders of the teams. Yes, I guess the lawyers too. Sorry, lawyers. Um, the Federation, have to sit down and say, look, this is what's happened in the past. This is the past. We're dealing with a post-COVID world now. Let's all get on the same page and let's do this and work together because none of us benefit by screwing anybody else over. They have to get on the same page. And no more of this posturing, no more of this nonsense about you don't want to negotiate until the back pay situation sorted out, but the back pay situation can't be sorted out because that money comes from FIFA. And now the Federation 
They didn't have the money really to begin with to budget out anyway because they were trying to invest in different programs. Now you don't have the money because you've had to cut people from your books because you're, you're, you're losing money. You've had, like, no revenue this year. So now you got to wash all that away, and you got to create the best structure going forward. Everybody needs to put their, their adult pants on and go into a room and get it resolved because this stuff does not help anything with the game, and it's going to end up hurting the women more than it helps them to fight this fight that is not a good fight to fight at this stage. It wasn't a good fight to begin with because you didn't structure it properly. The Federation is trying to get it right, in my opinion. They screwed up and they opened the door. They did. But now you're to a point where they can't fix the FIFA bonus part. Right. There's no way. And I, I worry it affects the NWSL. I worry that the Federation, and we talked about it before, that the Federation says, well, because we have to do this now, we can't fund the NWSL. And then what happens? I mean, yeah. th- there's so many different knock-on effects. It can't be about paying 20 players on the women's national team a salary at the expense of growing the game, at the expense of the women's you know, league, at the expense of all these things. It can't be that anymore. You've got to find a way to make it work for where we are today. And it, it's, it, it's becoming a distraction. I really hope they can fix this. Maybe the, the realities of the pandemic can help fix it. I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, understanding proportionality, like you were saying, when it comes to FIFA and payouts from World Cups, I think is key. I went back and looked at some of Caitlin Murray's work, uh, not just yesterday, but back in February when everything started uh, in courtrooms and lawsuits and lawyers were involved. And let me let me read a, a passage here from her February piece. She says, but one flaw in applying the men's CBA to the women which U.S. soccer will surely push back on, remember this is back in February, yeah. is that a significant chunk of that money will have come from bonuses determined by FIFA. The U.S. m and as a team can earn up to 20, around $25 million if it wins the World Cup, in large part because FIFA would give U.S. soccer $34 million as okay. a prize. So 25 but, and 34 okay. But U.S. soccer has only agreed to give the women $2.5 million, remember this is February, because FIFA offers such a smaller prize for the Women's World Cup. It appears... The U.S. WNT is, in this specific example, holding U.S. soccer responsible for FIFA's discrimination against women. That's Caitlin two, Murray. Two and a half. Do you got a calculator handy? Uh, yeah. Two and a half out of four is what percentage? Uh, 25 out of 40 is 12 and a half out of 20. So 62 and a half percent. What is the percentage on the men's side if it's 25 out of... Is it 38? I think it was 38. Let me see. It was 38 or it was 36. I want to get it right. Um, 38. Okay. It was 38. Okay. So, so 38 times 62.5%? Yeah. Is what, what, is, what is that number? That number is 23.75. Okay, so it's a little bit more percentage-wise that the men would get than the women would get. Okay, that's got to be equal. Sort that out. If, if you had it on your books that they would get 25 of 38 million if the men won, then you probably need to bump that up by, instead of 2.5, it's probably 2.8, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, 2.75, I don't know. Doesn't matter. Okay, that's a few hundred thousand. You can't hold U.S. soccer responsible for how FIFA gives out bonuses. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Right, yeah. Um, they've all got, again, they've all got to sit down. They've all got to be adults. They've all got to secure the future of the NWSL because that is critical because it can't just be about the players on the national team. It has to be about giving women an opportunity to be professional players. It's about growing those clubs. It's about creating academies for those clubs. It's about all of those things. That's going to take money. You can't affect the future of that because a small number of players want more money. That doesn't make sense. You've got to grow it. You've got to start treating all of this like a business. Women's soccer has to be treated like a business to grow. It can't be treated like a charity. 
you've got to make it sustainable. It's not sustainable if 20 or 25 players in the women's national team pool are making the bulk of money that's spent out to women's soccer professional players in the country. You've got to find a way to make that all make sense. You can't, and U.S. soccer cannot back out of their support of NWSL. I know they committed to do it for a certain period of time. You know, I think maybe before Cindy Parlow Cone came in, maybe there would have been the potential for ill will to say, well, you want this money and we can't do this, and now we can't spend this here, et cetera. They can't do that. I don't think they will with her in charge. Right. But you can't take money from the overall good to go to a small number. You just can't in this situation. They've right. all got to sort this out. Um, I think the way it's been portrayed a lot of times has been incorrect. You know, it is now boiled down. Now that they got the working conditions sorted out, which should have been sorted out a long time ago. Yep. Some of that's down to the way the different CBAs were negotiated at different times, and, and the men would get an updated CBA on some of this stuff, and they didn't update the women's automatically. Now that's also included, thankfully. So it's an automatic. If one gets an increase in the per diem, then the other gets the increase. Good. All get on the same page. The men need to go sit down to use their lobbying power to get this right. They all need to sit down and get this right going forward. Yep. They have to. Uh, I mean, Jason Nick says this, and and it, this is a, a tough element, and I think it gets left out of the, the, the situation here a lot says, isn't the problem right now you're asking U.S. soccer to subsidize women's soccer when they don't have to do that for the men's? And, and in a lot of ways, yes. And I think they do have to subsidize it because in the past, and they, they didn't directly subsidize it. There are people who will lead you to believe this with MLS. There are lots of the uh, ProRail for USA side that will skew the way MLS actually got started. There are questions because Alan Rothenberg was involved, and we've uh, talked about this on Soccer Files uh, the last couple episodes I did over the weekend. Rothenberg was the president of U.S. Soccer. He was also heading up what became Major League Soccer. They got approved for the Division One status. Yeah, you could ask questions there. There were no other viable options. The APSL had seven teams, and they'd say they're going to have 16 the next year, and then teams would fold in midseason or not even make it to the season, and that's not viable to be a Division One league. It never was. I mean, the Atlanta Ruckus played in a high school park that was about 60 yards wide, and the field was so crowned you couldn't see the people's feet on the other side of the field. That's wow. not a first division league. No. Um, the other option wasn't even soccer. It was like a bastardized version of the game called League One America. And the other was MLS. Like That was the three competing situations. Um, they picked the one that ended up working. <laughs> I mean, it did. Uh, you can like it or not like it. It worked. And people said, well, they should have done X, Y, or Z when they were awarded the World Cup. And they didn't. Because nothing else happened. Like Werner Fricker's idea was, and I'm going way deep in the weeds here, but I'm working back. That's that's Werner, all right. Werner Fricker's, go, I'll be right back. Okay. Werner Go Fricker's idea, the president of U.S. Soccer, when they, awarded, when they were awarded the World Cup, was to let it grow out of the amateur game. And this was 1988. It didn't happen. So they pushed to create MLS. U.S. Soccer did not subsidize MLS at the beginning. The World Cup had seed money into U.S. Soccer to get it off the ground. And that money was paid back. So they did not subsidize it. Did they create a pathway for MLS to be successful by only sanctioning one Division I league? Yes. There was no one else that deserved a Division I sanctioning. The women need that kind of support. And I think they need the kind of financial support that the men didn't need at that time because they were able to go out and get investment. You have to invest in the women's game to grow it. It will take time. It will absolutely take time. Um, that means the NWSL has to be protected. Professional academies on the women's side need to grow and need to be protected. There's a lot of work to do in that. I don't want to see that cut. Uh, Modiflow, it is idealistic, but a uh, hot take from Modiflow is that you shouldn't get paid to play for your country. Um, again, just ideologies attached to sentiment. Um, you are committing your time. You are risking injury. You know, there is a lot of money on the line in these things. I, I don't have a problem with it. 
I, I think it in this case is maybe becoming too much of the issue. But for the length in the majority of the time the women's national team has been a program, one, they've made U.S. soccer a lot of money because of their success. That is true. They have not had the opportunities at the professional level to get paid in the same way. And you would have been in the situation that uh, curling or handball or volleyball is in where you know people can't compete at the elite world level because they can't be professional in that sport. So, you know, you have the U.S. Olympic Committee that, that bridges the gap in some of these situations. But, you know, if, if you have to get a day job, like it's hard to be an elite women's soccer player if you have to get a day job. So you have to invest. Um, Burns says probably the best return on investment would be to spend money to pressure FIFA to increase bonuses for the Women's World Cup with increased TV rights value should be imminently possible. I totally agree. The money should come from TV rights and sponsorships from the World Cup. U.S. soccer should work with Soccer United Marketing more on the women's side for women's specific situations around NWSL and the women's national team to grow it. You know, you look at sponsors. There are sponsors who would sponsor the women's national team and not sponsor the men's national team. There are probably some that are vice versa as well. Go out and sell it. You have a great team. You have a team that has captured the imagination of a lot of people Go out and sell it and maximize it and grow the salaries over time. You can't be what the WUSA was where you spent three years of money in a year because you overpaid on salaries. The money wasn't there. You couldn't bank on that money coming in by the end of year one. It was an investment. The second professional women's league, even more dysfunctional. You, you, you were paying too much in salary than what you were making. And you can't do that over time. We're seeing it now with clubs. You get to a point that you can't afford to pay that. And what happens? You go to business. You don't want that to happen on the women's game ever again. It can't. We need to be having these conversations like we've had about the Montreal Impact today. We need to be having these conversations you know, about the Orlando Pride. You know, Don't change your name in 30 years. You have history attached to it. You need them to last 30 years. They can't last 30 years if they pay more money than they bring in or if they're not subsidized to grow to the point where they can be self-sustaining. You need the investment now. It is a worthy investment. It is making up for inequality over the years, 100%. And it will grow the game if done correctly. But everybody needs to get to the same table now. They really, really do. Modiflo says, wasn't it just a few years ago that MLS players on lower salary deals were practically on food stamps and working second jobs? Eh, that was a, a while. I don't think anybody was actually on food stamps. I think that, that might be an exaggeration. There were some players who worked second jobs, and a lot of times these were players who were at the very bottom of the pay scale. And a lot of times those second jobs were like youth coaching, which not to say it's easy money, but it's it's a little different than... Uh, Troy Perkins, who was playing for D.C. United, when he was on his rookie deal and backing up Nick Raimondo, was working, I think, in a bank. Um, okay, that's a little different. But then when he started to play and got a new contract, then he didn't have to work at the bank anymore. Yeah. Um, that happens in other countries, too. Yeah. And that's where the, the finances were. The league's making more money now. They're paying more in salary. They're still not making big profits every team. But more money's coming in, they can pay more salary. So, uh, Johannes, oh, very good. And we're going to end on this. He says, by the way, handball should be so much more popular in the U.S. It has everything Americans want. Speed, scoring, physicality, excitement, etc. I like it. I, I need to understand the rules a little bit better. Um, I would love to see a pro handball league. I would really love to see a pro handball league. Um, I think they tried to do that at one point. I want to say in the 90s, because you had a goalkeeper here... Yeah. who played for the Atlanta Attack, who played for the U.S. handball team in 96, uh, Yarrow, um, played for the Atlanta Magic in indoor, um, really good indoor soccer goalkeeper, and a really good goalkeeper in handball. I think they tried to do a handball league, if I remember correctly. And they had it like down at East Point or something for the venue, if uh, I remember correctly? No, I don't think it was in East Point. Um, I don't remember where it was. Anyway, I, that was the Olympics. I, I think 
they tried to do a, a national handball league, and it just didn't take off. I'd love to see something like that. I'd love to learn the game a little bit better, to be honest. Oh, yeah. No, I saw – actually, that was one of the uh, the events I saw in the 84 Olympics out in L.A. Uh-huh. It, it was uh, team handball. They played it at F- uh, Fullerton's uh, basketball arena, and it was Iceland against South Korea, and we got right behind the goal. It was amazing. Was the Iceland team overly defensive? Uh, no, they were not. Actually, well, it was a it, it was a uh, it was an offensive slugfest. It was like eleven eight by the time it was over. Well, that's good. I'm glad that their handball team in 1984 was not overly defensive. Yes. Um, all right, we could keep going down rabbit holes. It's after eleven. We're going to stop here. Uh, stop. It's <laughs> time at two o'clock. Yep. Facebook.com slash ninety nine the game. Uh, you got Champions League today. You've got uh, Copa Libertadores this evening. You've got Copa Sudamericana. We'll have a lot of things to talk about tomorrow. There will be more teams that announce their roster moves in MLS. Uh, There will be more managerial rumors all over the world. So stay tuned to all of that. Make sure you're following us at Soccer Down Here. Follow John because he's still trying to make his Twitter actually function correctly. OSG Wilson. Yes. Um, I'm at Longshoe on Twitter, and we'll be back tomorrow. Mucho plato, y'all. Mucho plato, y'all.